Today we're going to be talking about the Age of Camelot, uh, which is the name given to the short couple of years, almost three years, that John F. Kennedy was in the White House. So Kennedy became the youngest elected president in American history in November of 1960. He defeated the, the sitting vice president, Richard Nixon, um, and in doing so, he brought a lot of youth and vitality to the White House. He was replacing Dwight Eisenhower, the outgoing president, who was one of the oldest presidents we've had. And so the, the mood of the White House really changed when Kennedy was elected. Um, he was a lot different in, in several ways. He was young, he was very charming, and he had a beautiful family. His sort of energy, the, the youth and the vigor that he brought with him, really revitalized the White House. The White House became sort of a center for arts and culture. They uh, invited in, you know, performers and singers and dancers. And, and so the White House really became a symbol of um, the arts during this period. His time in office, which again is, was pretty short, um, less than three years, came to be called Camelot after the sort of enchanted mythical kingdom of the play that was on Broadway at the time and, and the story that's, that's been around a long time of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And so one, Kennedy really liked the, the songs from the musical, but two, people sort of saw his time in office as this sort of bright, shining moment um, where the ideals of Camelot were in, in the White House. Um, but as we know, there's some questions there of, of how, how true that really is or how much of it is kind of wishful thinking looking back. So we're going to take a look at Kennedy's domestic achievements and failures in office as well as his foreign affairs. So Kennedy's domestic record... Kennedy created a list of goals for the nation early on in his presidency, and he called this the new frontier. He said America's on, on, on a new frontier, and his goals were many. They included increasing money for education, creating programs to reduce poverty. We know that the 1950s, um, while being an age of affluence, was also an age of poverty for many people, raising the minimum wage for the working class, increasing medical care for the elderly, passing a civil rights bill that would ban racial discrimination. These are very broad goals for America. But unfortunately, Kennedy, Kennedy um, did not work particularly well with Congress. He ran into a lot of roadblocks. Republicans opposed his new frontier agenda, and even some members of his own party, the Democrats, blocked his goals. And so some of the new frontier programs passed, but a lot of them ended up getting killed in Congress. Also on the domestic front, Kennedy was hoping to improve the U.S. economy. And he laid out sort of a two-part approach to how he wanted to do that. He was successful at one, but not the other. He was successful at increasing defense spending. He helped ramp up the defense budget by 20%, and that put billions of dollars back into the U.S. economy, creating weapons and bombers and things like that, which um, not only helped the economy, but, but boosted up our military forces as well at, at kind of a crucial time in the Cold War. Kennedy was not so successful at passing a large tax cut. Um, he wanted to push this through, but once again, Congress blocked his efforts. So some successes, some failures. Another area where Kennedy has a mixed record was civil rights. During the presidential campaign in 1960, Kennedy promised a lot of action on civil rights. He had hoped to um, get the African-American vote. 
He had hoped to make progress on civil rights in America, but once he took office, he became much more cautious. He was worried about angering members of his own party, especially those from the South. So he backed off once he got into office, and he instead chose to put more of his effort and attention into enforcing the laws that were already on the books. And as you can imagine, this upset many African Americans who had voted for him. He talked a big game, and they expected him to back it up, and they felt disappointed that once he got into office, he didn't do so. Eventually, Kennedy did propose a civil rights bill after he saw what was going on in Birmingham with the Children's March and, and everything down there. But, again, Congress blocked it. One area of, of success for Kennedy was his proposal that we land a man on the moon. Uh, Kennedy comes out early in his presidency and says, we should make it a goal that before the 1960s is out, to put an American on the moon and bring him safely back to Earth. And while we were behind the Soviets for a while, they, they beat us into space. They sent the first man into orbit, things like that. We eventually caught them and passed them and beat them to the moon. In fact, we landed on the moon twice before the 1960s were up. Let's move on to Kennedy's foreign affairs record, where once again, he has a mixed record of, of achievements. For one area where Kennedy really, really failed on the foreign affairs front, we'll look at the Bay of Pigs invasion. So what was this? Well, in April of 1961, just a couple of months after taking office, Kennedy approved a really poorly planned mission to try to go down to Cuba and overthrow its communist leader, a guy by the name of Fidel Castro. We took a bunch of Cuban exiles, and the CIA trained them. Um, and these guys were supposed to return to Cuba, land at the Bay of Pigs, which you can see on the small little map, and start a rebellion that would rise up and overthrow the Castro regime. Well, instead, uh, just about everything that could go wrong did. They botched the landing, their, their ships got stuck on a coral reef. By the time they got to shore, um, the, the exiles were uh, quickly killed or captured. And it was very clear that we were behind it. So this, this kind of blew up in Kennedy's face. Um, and early in his presidency, uh, really made a lot of people question his decision making. An event that also involved Cuba, but ended up being um, a foreign affairs win for John F. Kennedy, was the Cuban Missile Crisis. In October of 1962, U.S. spy planes got pictures of Soviet missiles being put into Cuba. Well, obviously, Cuba being less than 100 miles away from Florida, that's a major problem. Kennedy simply could not allow the missiles to remain there. It would be way too big of a threat to the United States and other countries close by. But he didn't want to rush in and start a war either. Kennedy got a lot of pressure from his military advisors who were recommending that he bomb Cuba. Some were recommending that he invade Cuba um, and, and just take over the island. Kennedy instead chose to go a different route. He chose to blockade the island instead, not allow any more Soviet ships to come bring missiles. And that put pressure on the Soviets. It sort of made it their move. In the end, the Soviets agreed to remove the missiles from Cuba in return for a promise from the United States not to invade Cuba. And the Soviets and the U.S. agreed in secret to remove U.S. missiles from Turkey. That one was kept secret um, from the public for a while uh, because Kennedy didn't want it to look like we were trading missiles. But that was part of the agreement. 
So the Cuban Missile Crisis brought us pretty darn close to armed conflict with the Soviets, but ultimately Kennedy handled it very well and was able to keep us out of a war and also to get the missiles out of Cuba. What's going on in Berlin? We know Berlin in a lot of ways is the center of the Cold War. Well, in August of 1961, East Germany takes a, a very drastic step and begins building a wall around West Berlin. The reason they did this was to prevent East German workers from fleeing into West Berlin. There were lots of workers uh, year in and year out in East Germany who were leaving and, and going over, they didn't want to be a part of the communist country anymore, and they were going over to democratic West Berlin to live and work. Well, the Soviets and the East Germans couldn't allow that to continue to happen. They, they relied on their workforce, so they built a wall to keep people from leaving. Kennedy actually ends up going to Berlin. He gives a speech in front of tons of people, as you can see in the picture here, where he offered his support to West Berlin and, and promised that the U.S. would not abandon them. Um, he famously told the crowd that ich bin ein Berliner, um, which means I am a Berliner. Technically, it means I'm a jelly donut. But um, he was letting them know, you know, I identify with you. I consider myself to be in this fight with you. We're not going to abandon you. But... Kennedy was not willing to go so far as to rip down the wall, um, as that might have, again, caused a war. So, how does this period end? How does Camelot come to an end? Well, as we know, Kennedy ends up being assassinated. While campaigning for re-election in 1963, he's driving through the streets of Dallas, sitting up on the back of a convertible in a motorcade, and he's shot uh, and killed. Police arrested the gunman, a guy by the name of Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, but Oswald himself was killed before he could explain why he shot the president. So there's tons of conspiracy theories out there, whether he acted alone or whether he was killed um, because of, to keep quiet because of some sort of crazy conspiracy. So there's all kinds of conspiracies. Um, but the, the historical evidence is fairly straightforward. Lee Harvey Oswald was the only gunman. He shot and killed the president. Kennedy's vice president, Lyndon Johnson, was sworn in shortly afterwards. And Johnson is going to pledge to continue Kennedy's legacy and to build upon Kennedy's legacy.